the future of learning. That's what we want to talk about in a time of uh, a pandemic, basically. 30 million Nigerians are affected as COVID-19 is said to be increasing learning poverty. That's according to a report by the World Bank. Uh, to help us um, understand this, it, it's, there's a leap in the percentage of people who have been disenfranchised, so to speak. We have two uh, very um, resourceful um, professionals with us. One in the studio, uh, we have Mr. Jide Ayegusi, education entrepreneur. Thank you very much for joining mm -hmm. us. Well, I hope I got you. that closely. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Lady uh, Detru Ogwa. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. All right. Um, uh, uh, Detru uh, Ogwa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, we'll start from the very basic this morning. Um, all right, so let, let, I think I would start with uh, Lady Deton. Uh, help us understand what exactly learning poverty is uh, for those who you know, might be okay. a little confused. Well, I think it's, I mean, the World Bank has you know, um, defined it as the inability to read or understand a simple text by the age of 10. So when a child cannot read, um, obviously it impedes their ability to succeed in school um, and beyond. And I mean, we, we're all aware that you know, education should be, you know, a public good or um, allows us to um, address inequalities in any society. So obviously, if a child cannot read by the time they're 10, um, it, it's described that they are poor uh, at the level of learning and perhaps at the level of thinking. Um, and, and it's essential that we address, you know, how to strengthen an, uh, our education to become, uh, to provide that common good. People must be able to read, must be able to learn, must be able to think in a way that they can then, you know, sustain their lives and, you know, their livelihoods. Okay. All right, let, let, let's come to you. They said there's a, a, uh, an increase by 10 points from 53% uh, to 63% of those that are going to be suffering from this, uh, majorly children. And we add to this the number of children that are out of school. What are some of the um, deficiencies, basically, what are some of these weaknesses in our education system that the World Bank report um, is referencing? Uh, so let me let me start by you know going back again to defining what um, uh, learning poverty is, right? So so that we really understand uh, critically what it means for children. So it's just basically illiteracy at the elementary level, right? So you know most times we talk about adult illiteracy, inability to read or write. But for kids at say below ten. If they're unable to read and write, that is learning poverty. And don't forget that report says that um, uh, it used to be 53, right? And that's globally. Don't forget that in Nigeria, we used to rank like highly when it comes to stuff like this. So in Nigeria, it was not 53. It was about 70 oh. to yes, right? So oh. yes, and that's really sad. So imagine what, uh, what COVID-19 has caused. And I mean, how it has widened the gap you know, that it used to be, and just imagine where, it's gonna, where it is at the, at, at the moment. So it, it's really um, a sorry case. Um, the challenges in the education system, uh, uh, to your weaknesses, question, yeah. are weaknesses, right? It's um, basically for me too, right? Which is one, uh, access. So when we're talking about access, we're saying that a lot of our kids are not able to access education. And we're talking about 13 million. Some will say, some will say 10 million, some will say 11 million. Whether it's 10 or 13 million, it's the highest in the, in the, in the world, right? Uh, so many of these kids are unable to access education. And the great majority of the kids in school um, are not learning anything, which is what we call learning crisis, right? So um, which is what we're saying, like about 70 of these kids, 70% 70 of these kids would be out of primary school and they would be unable to read or write, right? And that is another challenge. And what are some of the reasons why we have this, why we have these gaps? So let's go to access to uh, education. Poverty is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of our kids are not accessing edu education at all. So if you go to the north, you, poverty is actually very high. And um, many of these parents cannot even afford um, uh, basic things like uniform, right? Um, stationaries. I mean, governments cannot provide these things. Education is supposed to be free, right? But there are certain things that parents, certain bronze that parents will bear, like providing uniform, textbooks. Um, reading materials, um, uh, sandals, you know, so much, those things, right? And even feeding. feeding. So, um, because of this, a number of these parents are unable to send their kids to school. 
Uh, the second um, reason is illiteracy at the adult, adult, adult level, right? So where a number of these parents really do not know what education means for the future of their kids. So if you do not know, it, it is said that you cannot give what you do not have. So if you do not know the reason why your kids should go to school, you will not, you will not, there's no, there will not be any uh, motivation on your part to send them to school. That is access. Now, what about quality education that we, that the, the, rate, um, the level of quality education, that, the level of education that we're providing for kids in school, we said it's, we said it's very, very poor. Why is it poor? One, we have um, our schools being uh, infested, let me use that word, with a lot of, with teachers that are not really passionate about the job. T so, teachers that are qualified but are not passionate about the job. And a, lot of, a number of these teachers are also not qualified. And why do we have teachers that are not qualified? Most times, we get these teachers into the job because there's no job for them elsewhere. Right? So, um, Felicity, you're running out, running out of time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, you know, um, our curriculum is archaic, archaic right? right? So, we, we use the curriculum that, that was used to prepare our, fa our forefathers for the world of factory, right? To prepare our kids. We're going to the fourth industrial revolution, but we're still using the curriculum you know, that was prepared like many, right. many years right. ago. I, I want to, let's go back to Lady uh, Dayton Ogo. The, the reasons, you know, including the ones that he has mentioned um, are enormous. There's, there's so much of it. Um, and now we're faced with a pandemic that has increased, you know, the figures negatively, I believe, if there's anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want your thoughts on how we will be able to solve this you know we first of all need to have the political will and of course understand that there is a problem but how far were we how well was the country doing with sorting out the education challenges that we had in the past and now we are compelled to of course add more of those challenges to um, uh, to the list did we do well enough in the past do you think we will be able to sort this one out uh, thanks um I think we've had enough conferences, we've had enough seminars, and we've belabored, you know, the issue that Nigeria can do better um, when it comes to its educational outcomes. And, I mean, obviously, the pandemic has given us an opportunity, um, and we really cannot return to the world as it was before. What I'm glad about is that some of those conversations around, you know, um, the sustainable development goals, and... I would, I would posture that what we need to start questioning is really the relevance and the utility of how we've defined what education should do for the Nigerian child. Perhaps, you know, we are, there's, there's something faulty around our visioning, our, you, know, our, you know, beginning with the end in mind. So, you know, the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable Development has already given us a blueprint of what we should be doing, um, how we should be acting. We cannot get outcomes that we're not, careful um, to coordinate. We've, we've had so many, you know, uh, as I said, uh, conferences. And maybe one of the things that we need to start doing is to look at, you know, when we're reforming education, we should understand that it is a common good. Um, every child has a right to education. And what, when maybe we need to start putting in practical terms in, you know, 3D, what that means. I think what, what, what I found fundamentally missing is our philosophy of education. And a lot of our state actors, those who are custodians of the process at this time, have, have actually admitted to that. So, you know, there's no rocket science in, in, you know, I think what we really need to start doing is having more deliberate, you know, um, actionable, what we are going to do. What are we going to do to put 30 million kids in school? Are we going to start exploring, you know, different ways? We're not going to keep ourselves, you know, uh, reduced to just physical spaces in classrooms. It, it calls for collaboration within, you know, open source providers of technologies, uh, for teachers right. to collaborate, getting youth themselves involved in the framing of the solution, constructing what makes for change for All young right. people. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me interject quickly. You, you said we already yeah. have like a blueprint of how to go about it. But if you were to suggest that one of, one of the things that yeah. our report mentioned is a vision yeah. um, of the future should be guided by today's investment and policy reform. So if, if you were mm -hmm. to start, which of these policies yeah. can we begin to implement without too much of a huddle, uh, even at a time of uh, pandemic, as it were? 
I, I, I'm trying to understand your question, but would it be around provision? Would it be around access? I Policy think one of the biggest problems we have you, in Nigeria. You mentioned that there, there are... Anywhere. Sorry, I didn't get that. I think one of the major problems we have is, you know, how do we protect domestic and international financing of public education? I've looked at so many documents on a project I'm working on for the ILO at the moment, and we seem to be throwing money at this challenge. We're throwing millions of dollars at this challenge, and we're not getting the right outcomes. So what we need to also be critiquing or probably not or, or working better to do is strengthen even the public administration process of education. Is the money going where it's supposed to go? And I think that why the reason why you know where transparency is a problem, accountability is a problem, is you know the rent seeking attitudes that we have brought into this to this sector. And we must be, you know, we must have the courage to start challenging even those those. You know, our administrative system is broken. Let's speak okay. truth to power. Right, is the then. money going where it's supposed to go? And the numbers, are we educating the most numbers? How do we play catch up with the rest of the world? You All know, right. those are the uh, fundamental let's, let's problems that to, we need uh, to fix. And we must find the courage to do those things. All right, I want to go back to Gide um, here. Uh, she, she's mentioned, you know, the fact that we're throwing money. We keep pouring money, you know, at it. Um, it's almost very similar to, you know, some of the things that we've, you, you know, gotten international um, donors for in Nigeria that still we weren't able to solve, um, but millions of dollars have gone into. So if you, if you were going to be um, strategic with sorting you know, uh, this uh, issue out and solving the problem, um, where would you suggest that we start to tackle first? The government has tried the school feeding program. And there's also been, of course, um, you know, policies here and there that should encourage more people to go to school, but still doesn't seem to be working. So what would be your strategic um, um, first move? Yeah, for me, um, the, the, problem in the, the problems in the education system is actually very, uh, very, um, uh, very, very systemic, let me use that word. And it's um, hydra-headed. So when you're trying to solve one problem, another one comes up, right? So it's really tricky at the moment to say this is where government should focus on. But I strongly believe that um, we're actually not spending enough, right? So the money she's talking about, maybe um, one that's come from the, from, the, from the diaspora, right, from the international donors. But how much are we committing as a government? So UNESCO says 26%, right? We do far below that, that amount, and that cannot do anything, right? For me, the number one thing, if I'm talk, just um, I suggest um, here, I would say that we need to motivate our teachers, right? So um, you you cannot you cannot have teachers that are not well motivated in passing knowledge to the people, right? So they will not be doing their best. And when I'm talking about motivating teachers, I'm talking about teachers in the public education system, right? So the teachers in the private some of these top private schools are paying a bit more, and the teachers are really motivated enough to to want to impart solid knowledge to the kids, and that's why we're having them churning out a quality product. But for the public schools. Reverse is the case. So they're just very lackadaisical like, about, about the whole thing because they're not wearing the Well, motivating the teachers bring more kids to school. Teachers are from families. They are not, they are not, um, they, they do not come from heaven. So they are from different families. I strongly believe that we can, as well, we we'll use teachers to bring more kids to the schools. All right. right. Uh, let, let, let's quickly um, get the last thought uh, from um, Mrs. Ogwa. The... There is something in that report that I want to mention again. And there's, it says the pandemic is not completely um, a terrible, that there are some new things. Let me see if I see, um, I have it the way, um, I can say the way it's here. It said the COVID-19 has opened a window of opportunity for education system to move to a part of accelerated progress. It also said it is now possible to bring forward to today, elements that many would have thought was part of future of learning. What are some of these elements that the COVID-19 has amplified that we might think to expand if we are to improve, maybe add to what we already know and help the education system? I think it just speaks to the fact that we now have more free and very open source technologies available to teachers and students. And that itself is an opportunity um, now, there's never been any time in the world where we've had so much content. Um, and, and, and I like that the fact that we give, um, you know, teachers um, the, the power to, to do more of what it is that they, 
that they should do. And, and, you know, whether we like it or not, this provides an opportunity for us to reflect on the curriculum. Um, we, we have to start advancing scientific knowledge, you know, stronger, fight misinformation, those things, you know, I, I would say it's a real opportunity, whether the system is ready to embrace, you know, um, the, the public and the private collaboration that is going to take to educate the most numbers of children is another dimension of the situation. With the public sector cannot do it alone. The private sector has the funds. There needs to be more deliberate collaboration and collecting of data of what works. The okay. habit of just throwing money at some of these issues. There was a fight on Twitter yesterday because someone presented data from a consulting firm. We cannot be making conversations or we cannot be having conversations merely on the strength of sentiment. As a country, we must start understanding what the data, this, I mean, we, we're appreciating the fact that the World Bank has given us this data. We must start strengthening those local capabilities as well. What All is right, the data uh, there's, saying there's, from there's community to community about the numbers of children that are learning and how, what platforms and ways are they learning? And I think that the family also has a responsibility in also supporting the learning and the thinking of the children using some of this open source opportunity. So right. we don't there's, limit all of this to the schooling system at thank, all. Thanks the a lot. The home itself also takes thanks. a responsibility in educating our children. Really brilliant thoughts, uh, um, Dayton Thanks Walworth. a lot. Um, thanks a lot. I, I want to get final thoughts from um, GD here. The, thank the, you very of much course, for the time. Uh, perspective you know, of the Nigerian government itself and its interest in education it's, it's, is extremely important. And, you know, like you've said, you know, 26%, we're nowhere close. We've, we've struggled to even, you know, do, you know, 10% in the past and didn't make it. So final thoughts from you on where we're headed and what should be done. Uh, so government should be committed to investing more in, in the education space. That's one. And at the moment, uh, technology seems to be like an area where we need to focus, right? So we need to invest in educational technology. But for that investment to really work, there are critical infrastructure that we need to also improve on, right? So power, because if you have tablets uh, for kids and there's no power to, to charge it, so you are joking, right? So uh, we need to also improve um, uh, in area in uh, accessibility to, 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 to internet. So because uh, sometimes we sit back in Lagos and sit back in Abuja and Portacon and think that the whole of Nigeria uh, uh, is that way. So we have a lot of people that are not able to access internet. You know, we have mobile penetration is very high, but access to internet is really very poor. So we need to make sure that we have all of this in place so that investment in technology will, will really work. Brilliant. Um, I must say thank you very much for coming to thank our you. studios. It's appreciated. And um, of course, uh, to you, ma'am, thank you so much for joining us on The Breakfast as well. Thank you very much. Merry yeah, Christmas. Have a good day. Merry Christmas again. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry right. Christmas. Thank you. Uh, same to you. Merry Christmas, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll go on a short break, and when we come back, we still have more to talk about Bishop Cooker. <laughs>